Hi, this is Misha. And I thought today we'd really dig into the whole Galil family. Gonna be pretty comprehensive here. We recently published a video kind of looking at the whole Uzi family, and we've done others, and we've done several videos on the Galil. But uh, I thought we'd get them all out here while I had them available. So here we have really the original. This is the ARM, which was standard. Over here, we have an example of an SAR, although this is a South African variation. We'll talk about that a bit, although it has its own feature video for lots of info on it. Then we have the Micro Galil. This is an Israeli variant made in the probably late 90s. Then we're going to look at the more modern guns. This is the full size IWI Ace, formerly the Galil Ace. This one's in 5.56, has the 16 inch barrel. And then finally we have the compact IWI Ace. This is the pistol version with the folding brace. And it's also in 5.56. So we have five Galils to talk about and we'll go from the history, from its genesis in the late 60s, all the way through today in the Ace. So what is the Galil? I, I, I'm sure most of you know. But this is based on the Kalashnikov operating system. It's actually based more on the original AK-47, AK Type 3. However, it fires 5.56-223 NATO rather than the X-39 rounds, either 7.62 or 5.45. It feeds from AK style rock in mags with an AK style paddle release. We have an AK style reciprocating handle. Very much AK style trigger group. AK style fixed long stroke gas piston, gas tube, so on and so forth. But we have many, many other features. Well, let's begin at the beginning. Israel became a nation in 1948. And for the next decade, we'd use a whole range of guns. Uh, first, just leftover guns from the Second World War. Whatever they could get their hands on. A lot of uh, Mausers, K-98s, Enfields, lots of submachine guns, lots of 1919s. Then in 1951, they really started to adopt the Uzi, which was in service by 54 and was just becoming available in largest numbers for the Suez Crisis. In 55, they adopted a relatively early version of the FNFAL called the Romat for the light barrel version, which had a 21-inch light barrel. And they also adopted the heavy barrel version. They were one of the few users of the heavy barrel, actually, known as the MacLeon. FN would call it the FALO, Fallow. And it would have the 21 inch barrel as well, but a different flash rider. The barrel was heavier, came with a bipod, so on and so forth. Story for another day. The FALs that Israel used were originally made in Belgium. They never made their own from scratch, although they did end up making a lot of parts and just building them around Belgian receivers. And of course they fired 7.62 NATO from 20 round detachable box mags. The FAL is one of my favorite guns, as anyone who watches the channel a good bit knows. But they used it in many, many skirmishes, border wars, conflicts, guard duties, so on and so forth throughout the 50s and 60s. And they found that it just wasn't that great, especially in the deep desert. At the same time, it was awfully long and heavy for urban fighting. And also, as the Israeli military, the IDF, became more and more mechanized, it was just really hard to get out of vehicles 
with this big long gun that didn't, did not even have a folding stock. It all kind of came to a head in 1967 with the Six Days War. A few things happened. Well, by this point, America had been using the M16 and its new 5.56 cartridge, which was higher velocity, very accurate for its size, had a good long range, and was very lightweight. You could carry a lot of ammo. It could also be fired out of a lightweight, relatively compact weapon. The early M16s actually performed very well, then they went through a little bit of a kind of a down slump around 64, but by 67 the A1 was adopted and they'd really worked out all the bugs. The cartridge had also been tinkered with going from stick to ball powder and all that stuff, so the cartridge was pretty well refined as well. It was a 55 grain round and was doing very well out of a 1 in 12 twist barrel. On top of this, Israel, the IDF, captured a large number of AK-47s and some AKMs from its adversaries, Arab adversaries, Egypt, Syria, so on and so forth. And they even ended up reissuing many of these to their special forces. But they were, of course, in a non-standard caliber for both Israel and NATO. But they worked in the desert better than the FAL. It's worth pointing out, as I said in the Uzi video, nothing works 100% in the desert. It's an extremely harsh proving ground, and it's not a matter of if something will fail, it's just a matter of when. So the AK would also fail, but not to the extent of the FAL. So, the IDF chief of staff decided it was time for a new weapon. It needed to be lighter, more compact, good if it fired the new 223 round, but above all, very durable and reliable in the desert. This is where two individuals, Yakov Lear, who was basically the CEO of IMI at the time, in the late 60s, and Israel Gali, came in. Israel Gali was one of their chief designers at IMI, and he started tinkering with captured AK-47s, AKMs. He would add a left side thumb safety to make the gun more ergonomic because the AK safety isn't the best in the world. He would mess with the sights, he would at attach bipods in various manners, trying to get more of a, a stable firing position, trying to make the gun a little more accurate, or at least you know, relative accuracy better and he would add various folding stocks onto them. Around 68, 69, he began kind of looking at the Finnish RK-62, the Valmet, which had been adopted in 1962 in Finland, but really hadn't gone into full-scale production and issuance in the FDF until 1965. Now this was a good fit for Israel. Now the, the, the RK-62 did fire 762 by 39, however, it was an AK-based operating system, which the Israelis already knew worked, but it was used by an ally, you know, a nominal ally of the West. It wasn't a comblock, so it meant that Israel did not have to work with, you know, a communist nation. No one really knows how much was done, but there's obviously some Finnish influences, and we have a video just comparing an M62 to this gun here. Things like the gas block front sight, dust cover, rear sight, generally speaking, and the machined receiver are very, very clearly Valmet. Now the bolt group, the trigger group, you could argue that can come from the Valmet or the captured AK-47s because they're very, very similar. But things like the gas tube are extremely, you know, specific to the Valmet, so they had to have come from there. They would do trials and testing in the late 60s and early 70s. Interestingly, the Galil design, Galil design, went up against a design from the creator of the Uzi, Uzi Gal, very similar last names, and the Israeli, or Israel I should say, sorry, Galil design 
won out. In 1971, it was recommended for adoption in the IDF, and by 72, it was given the go-ahead, and IAMI was told to go into production. And by 73, which was the year of the Yom Kippur War, there were a few Galils in IDF service. Not many, but it did see some limited use in that war. Also in that war, the FAL again proved itself to just be long, heavy, and not that great in the desert. So there was a big driving force to get the Galil into more soldiers' hands faster and faster. The idea was to replace not only the FAL, heavy and light barrels, but also some Uzis and some miscellaneous older guns in service. So they were kind of trying to go to a one-size-fits-all gun, which explains the feature set. Now this is an ARM. This was the standard version adopted, issued, used by the IDF in the 70s and 80s. This is an original kit with receiver stub that was re-welded by Tim Galil, Hibley Firearms, Jeff Miller. So it's quite authentic. Of course, like most things, it's kind of a mix of older and newer parts as these guns are rebuilt over the years. We have a barrel a little over 18 inches, about 18.3. It's relatively light profile, chrome lined, 1 in 12 twist rate. This has the earlier style birdcage flash hider. It does have a ring for a grenade, rifle grenade. We have a hooded front post sight, which has a hole in the top for adjusting. The gas block is non adjustable. We have a flip night sight. We have a ported gas tube, which removes very easily. This takes a standard NATO type of bayonet. That one here. Now, of course, Israel would make their own, but I have an Israeli, so I'll use my M9 because it was already out for another video. Not all ARMs would have a bayonet lug, and the original ones would actually use a separate ring on the barrel. Later ones, it would be all integral with this one block. As you see, we have a folding light bipod Doop. with quite large feet. This folds up into the handguard, quite so. This is the thing that could also be used as a wire cutter and de facto bottle opener. Originally the, hand, the, the bipods were more or less fixed in, they were held in with Eclipse. Later they would go to a QD style, quite late honestly during refurbishments. These hand guards are wood, as you see. Now these are painted. They're open on the bottom. Open on the top for good cooling. Flip around. We have a light carry handle, very FAL style as part of the hand guard retainer. We have an upswept cocking handle. As I said, this is a milled receiver. This has the lightning cut on this side. The other side you were looking at that can actually mount is dovetailed for a scope. This has a standard AK style safety with the thumb safety on the other side as you looked at. The rear side is very malmet, but instead of going to the adjustable ladder, this has a simple M16 style flip. We also have rear sights, night sights, to correspond with the front. This is all mounted on the top cover. We have a relatively large, at least long, pistol grip. We have a protected AK-style mag release with an extension on the right side for easy use. This fed from standard 35 round mags made of quite heavy duty steel. When they're new, they work great, but if they get dented, God help you. 35 was standard. This is a typical Israeli mag pouch. Holds 135 and one of the longer 50s. I don't have the 50 in this gun because the gun will monopod with this on. It's awfully long. 
you'd think it would hold more than just 15 rounds compared to the 35, but nope. That is what it holds. Very long, very heavy steel mag. And those dent very easily just because of how long they are and how much they'll hit the ground. Another key feature is this folding stock here. This is patterned after the FN FAL paratrooper and later the FNC would use a very similar system. It just pushes down. It doesn't have the lock like the FN. Folds over to the side. This is to make the gun very compact for those vehicle transports and also kind of compensate for our longer 18 inch barrel. This is one of the earlier style butt plates that's more curved. Later ones will be more straight. This is made as tubular steel with a polymer coated cheek rest for the desert heat or cold depending on where you're at. As you see this has very standard sling slots. This is uh, one of the heavier dutier IDF slings. Kind of a large version of the uh, Uzi sling. They had many many different sling types. This one has the ties. There was one with big clips which could be used. It was actually made for a light machine gun, but it would also fit this. There's a thinner, lighter version of this with the ties. And there's one that even has a neat, neat little pocket for earplugs. So yeah, looking at this, you can kind of see they were trying to replace both their light machine gun and their standard infantry rifle with one gun. Now, a lot of people consider the ARM to be the LMG version. It's not. Um, this was the, the version, the one gun orig originally used for infantry. Hence why we have kind of a combination. We have the longer barrel, but it's lighter. Bipod, but it's light. Carry handle, but it's very small. Folding stock, pretty standard size. It's not really beefed up any. It's just with a few extra features so it can be used as a light machine gun. Another version which saw extensive use in Israel was the SAR. This was the ARM. Well, they also had a carbine version, which we have here, known as the SAR. Now, as I said, this is a South African manufactured one, but it'll do for today. The IMI SAR had a 13.3 inch barrel, so we're losing five inches. No bipod. Some had bayonet lugs, they were located back here. Like with the ARM, they could either be part of the gas block or a separate ring. Since there wasn't a bipod, we have a standard enclosed handguard. It's still two pieces, but it wraps around. Early SARs would have wood handguards. They're actually pretty cool looking. Later ones would have polymer. No carry handle. And the receiver would be the same in the back. Sights the same. Stock the same. Really the only difference being the shorter barrel. Now the SAR was mostly issued and intended for vehicle crews, paratroopers, specialists, someone needing a nice compact gun. It was considerably lighter than the ARM thanks to not having all the gobbledygook like the bipod. And of course, five inches, some odd shorter. Now, I don't want to sidetrack too much in this video because this is about the Israeli. If you want to know more about the South African gun, check out that video. I'll just say that, like Israel, South Africa used the FAL. They called it the R1. They adopted it in 1960. However, there was a UN voluntary embargo placed on South Africa in 63, and this was made permanent by 1975-77. Sorry, I don't quite remember or at this point. It doesn't matter. But it was made a mandatory embargo, so South Africa could not get new guns, and at the same time, their FALs were aging. Long story short, they shopped around and they adopted the Galil. They would try it out in 1980, put it into production at Littleton, also known as Vector with a K, in 82. The ARM version was known as the R4. It was the same as the Israeli, but it had a longer handguard 
It had the longer, excuse me, the larger hoop front sight protector with the thinner post. And most R4s lacked the carry handle. Earliest ones had wood hand guards, but soon they would go to polymer. And they would also soon go from the metal standard buttstock to a longer, but made mostly a polymer buttstock, as you see on this one here. It's about an inch longer than the Israeli version, but it's honestly much lighter because it only has a metal frame inside. It's mostly very rugged polymer. So the R4 was the ARM, the R5 was the SAR with the shorter barrel. This is the LM5. This is the semi-auto version made in South Africa by Vector of that. There was also the R6, but we'll talk about it in a minute. But I am using this as my Defecto SAR for Israeli. Now, right after the Yom Kippur War, America approved emergency aid to Israel. So throughout 74, 75, a lot of money was given to the IDF as well as a lot of M16s and even some CAR-15 carbines. Keep in mind, America was out of the Vietnam War. They had excess, Colt had excess production. This is important for the Galil story because this is right when the Galil is starting to go into the IDF and yet now all these basically free M16s are coming into the IDF and even some CAR 15s. This really kind of stopped the Galil dead in its tracks. A lot of people think that the Galil was standard and very, very common in the IDF for a long time. It really wasn't. It was really only in frontline use for about a decade, and kind of in secondary use for about two. What they would do, they would, you know, special forces could of course have the Galil if they wanted it. The SAR still remained pretty common with tank crews, but most of the infantry started to be re-equipped or never even had the Galil. So they would have the M16. They, some of them would go straight from the FAL to the M16A1. And hey, since it's basically free, why not? So they would save the Galils for their primary things. This would also push the Galil to the export market. A lot of time and energy had been put into designing the Galil. There were plenty of nations that needed new guns, especially in the then new 223 cartridge. Keep in mind when the Galil was in development in the late 60s, aside from the M16, there were not that many other guns ready to go. I mean, the, the AR-18 was just coming on the scene. The FN at CAL was still in development. The FNC was way out. The Beretta AR-70 was still a ways off. SIGS 540 was still under development. About the only other major company making 223 guns for military export at that time was the HK 33, so HK in Germany. So it really kind of had a little bit of a monopoly even by the late 70s. It was still one of the most proven guns because it had been in production so long. And of course it had seen actual real world combat in an extremely tough proving ground. So IMI I found an international market. So what ended up happening, while the IDF would use AR-15 variants, IMI would manufacture and export the Galil for overseas customers, which was great because it brought in money. While the M16 was free for Israel, the Galil is relatively expensive to produce. Machined receiver, you know, having to set up, you know, wasn't cheap. On top of that, many standard infantry soldiers complained this gun was still long and heavy. Certainly compared to the M16, it's much heavier. Also, they complained about accuracy. The M16, thanks to much more stable rear sight especially, and its direct impingement system. It's not to say the Galil was not accurate, but the M16 was just more accurate. -er. So between cost, weight, accuracy, yeah, the M16 was a good choice for infantry. The Galil still excelled at being more durable and more reliable and requiring less maintenance. But at this time, and still even today, 
The IDF trains its rank and file soldiers to clean their weapons pretty much daily regardless. So the whole being able to go without cleaning wasn't really a major factor for the infantry. However, it was for tank crews, and this is why the SAR actually remained in many tanks even until uh, excuse me, 2003 in some places. This is because this wasn't a primary weapon for them. They would stick them in a tank and maybe not pull them out for weeks or months and only clean them every so often. So the SAR, the more compact version, was quite ideal for uh, tank crews and other vehicle drivers and such. So I did find a niche there. Probably the biggest use of the Galil in the IDF came in 1982 during a conflict with Lebanon. There were still a good number of Galils in service at the time. There were quite a few M16s as well, but there's still a number of Galils. After that, though, the Galil really started to go out of service. They, the IDF wasn't buying newer ones. Older ones like this were refurbished with newer parts as needed. But a lot of times when they brought them in for refurbishment, they would just kind of stick them in storage. Many, many more M16s, CAR 15s were given to Israel. In fact, the Israeli take on a CAR 15 is quite famous today. So by the early 90s, Israel kind of had a hodgepodge again of different guns. And this, this didn't work, really. So they officially adopted the M16 as standard issue, relegating the Galil ARM and SAR to secondary use and reserve use in the 1990s. And really, by the late 90s, most were pulled out of just regular rank and file service. So I don't want to say the Galil wasn't successful, but I don't think it was successful in a way they were anticipating. Its story kind of took some other twists and turns. So as I said, Israeli special forces would kind of keep using the Galil longer than the rank and file. But by the late 80s, they started to retire. They mostly preferred the SAR. There is another version that probably most of you are familiar with called the ARM, excuse me, the AR, which is a combination of the ARM and the SAR. Now, interestingly, the ARM was not ever officially adopted by the IDF, and it was only purchased by them in very small numbers, mostly for special forces. What the AR, AR I'm going to keep saying that, sorry, guys. <laughs> what the ARM was was basically an ARM, but with the gas block and handguard and handguard retainer from the SAR. So it was an ARM without bipod, without carry handle, and with the SAR style kind of U-shaped handguards. But it had the 18-inch barrel, 18 point whatever, of the ARM, the standard stock, the standard receiver, the standard sights, and the standard length gas system. It was a little lighter, but still delivered very good accuracy. While Israel did not use this in any numbers to speak of, it was actually very popular overseas. Many South American nations bought it, in addition to the ARM and SAR, of course. And it also started to see some use in Africa and East Asia. Because again, the Galil excelled at being durable and reliable and not needing a lot of cleaning. So a lot of third world nations saw this as an asset. And if they were just buying for their special forces, they could afford to buy a few thousand and that was that. So the AR became quite popular in the 80s. And as Israeli special forces retired out their older SARs, this gun here went into, into development. This is the Micro Galil, also known as the MAR, M-A-R. And this is a further compact version intended for special forces, trying to lure those guys back, airborne, and a lot of law enforcement. This is kind of a mid-generation micro Galil. There's a lot of evolution in this design, and it's going to be in its own little video talking about the ACE. We'll get to in a minute why that is. 
originally the Micro Galil would have a 7.8 inch barrel, kind of an interesting choice because that's the same length as the Mini Uzi, which was also being created in the early 80s. Later they would extend the barrel out to more like 8.4, 8.5, just a little bit longer, a little better velocity, a little better performance, a little better dwell time. They would also design a special flash hider for it. It's based on the late ARM pattern here. It has the ports versus the A1 slots. Now the rifle version of this would have a horizontal spring for a grenade. This instead has a hump here specifically there to make sure a rifle grenade could not be put on. And it has a small set screw here, little Allen screw. This would actually go into a hole small little indention in the threads to really lock this critter on. Also good for any kind of cutie suppressor stuff. So they made a special little f adaptation for the flash hider on this. They would have several different styles of handguard. This is the middle style. The original style would be about as short as a standard Galil, but tall. This has, of course, the more Galil style look, but it's extended in the back here where it overlaps towards the magwell. Also flares down here. It's a little bit shorter, but still covers the gas tube. And this is a late style, if I can find out where I stuck it, folks. That always happens to me. I thought I grabbed it. Oh dear. There it is. Why didn't you guys tell me that? Just say, hey, it's there. Hey, Misha, it's right there. Idiot. This is a laid style. You can tell it uses the same basic lines. But instead of having the more traditional Galil, now we have kind of pebble grain with more of a checkering, not checkering, but ribbing on the bottom for a better grip. And these handguards all attach differently. There's a single screw that runs to the front, and then they kind of go into the receiver. Very different method. They don't use a handguard retainer like the standard ARM Galil style. We also have a very short gas tube here. We have a very unique front sight. This is based on the Mini Uzi. We have two ears here with an adjustable front post. It can have tritium in it. The rear side is also based on the Mini Uzi. It still has the two flips, like on the full size, but instead of having a separate night side, oops, separate night side out front, that's now integrated into the tritium vials in the flips. And we have adjustable sides here that use the same tool as the Mini Uzi and later micro Uzi. Just covers pretty well the same otherwise, but a different side on it. Takedown is the same. Now the stock is different. Instead of having the hinge where you just press down, this actually has a push button here, spring loaded. And the hinge is integrated into the receiver itself to save on weight and bulk. This is a later style stock. It is polymer with a metal skeleton, not dissimilar at all to some of the styles used by South Africa. We have a rubber butt plate with some give to it. But the early stock was actually much thinner, had more of a sweep to it. It was just polymer, really had no metal. And it was kind of like a, really a, a micro or a mini Uzi stock, but it had a lot of flex in play and that's probably why they went to this one. This is a much more stable feeling stock, if not quite as slim. The original stock was very thin when folded over. We still use the safety here on the trigger, same pistol grip. This is all the same. Now the receiver itself is a little different. This is of course a US receiver made by CNC Warrior, but we don't always have the lightning cuts here. And actually the receiver in the front is, if you were able to see under the handguard, is very scalloped out here to save on weight. Also to save on weight, we have lightning cuts here, big scoop outs on our bolt carrier. The gas piston is very short. In fact, you can actually see the edge of the piston there. 
very crank style, very short gas system with virtually no piston. And as you see, this charging handle actually sticks to the side more than straight up on a standard glial. Now the earlier micro glials would have a more standard charging handle, but then they would go to this style, at least as an option. And then finally, we would also start doing what we call Orlite polymer mags. Still 35 rounds, still the rock-in style. But these would start to appear with this gun around the same time period. Sorry, these are really tight in this receiver for some reason. They go, but require a little bit of convincing. Like most polymer mags, they are very oversized and they have metal feed reinforcements, locking lugs, which is actually a good thing. There we go. So that's the Micro, the MAR Galil, which came about in the 90s and into the 2000s. It was kind of an ongoing project, targeted more and more at specialists and police versus standard military, hence why it's so compact and they try to make it as lightweight and why the design changed so much over time. That directly led to our final series here on the table. And we're actually having a separate video kind of getting more into these. So I'm going to kind of glance over the ace a bit. But I'm a complete cl completist. And I, I wouldn't uh, forgive myself if I didn't at least bring it up. This is an Israeli cleaning kit, by the way. Pretty standard issue. Just has a rope in it, boiler. Kind of HK style, really. And this is another kind of later, newer style Israeli mag pouch. Yeah, kind of adjustable. Holds two mags. It can either do M16 or Galil style. Made of a more modern nylon. Just brought stuff out for you to look at. But yeah, the Ace, which is quite familiar to most of you in America today. This is the Ace pistol. And 253556. And you probably already might notice some similarities with that micro. We're going to go through that all in the other videos. So if you want to talk about that or check out the details, definitely check out that video. But I'll just say here, you notice very similar sighting systems. This has an 8.5 inch barrel as well. The hand guards are basically the same. These are just updated with rails, but the style is the same. Interestingly, the Ace returns more to the traditional Galil style folding hinge where you just press down. We have a polymer lower to save on weight, but we still use the left side and right side safeties. We still have the scoop out and the bolt carrier here. Now notice there's no cutout here for the handle to travel in. Instead, the handle is located on the left side in the same kind of horizontal position as this one but on the other side and we have an FN style dust cover. Now this might seem like something that was introduced with the ACE but it's actually not true. This bolt system and this dust cover were actually on late production micros. Kind of interesting I think. Now, they don't have all the rails and stuff yet on the late micros but they do have the system. Also late in production, they would introduce an 11 inch barrel as an option, which is actually capable of mounting a bayonet or even firing a rifle grenade. Fun. They even introduced a 308, a 762 NATO version in the Micro Galeer series. But that led directly to the Ace, first known as the Galil Ace. This was Kind of the original styling. Over here we have the carbine styling. Now there's a lot of different versions of the Ace. This has a 16 inch barrel. Most of your military guns will actually go to the 18 inch and can have a bayonet lug. They offer these taking original Galil mags or NATO mags, as this one is here. This is the same gun as the pistol, 
but with the longer barrel, we return to the longer full-size gas system, whereas the pistol uses the micro size. The hinge is the same, it's just now we have the original stock. This is not obviously the Galil stock, although the hinge is, like I said, the same. It folds over. It also has six adjustable positions and even a removable cheek piece for use with optics. This is all made primarily of polymer to save on weight. Some reason they went to the polymer lower. They were trying to lighten up the Galil. I think it's a little funny that they lightened it up in some areas, like the receiver and the stock, but then they added a lot of weight back with the railed hand guards, even though these are primarily polymer. But really this big long top rail, especially on the carbine, which is metal, really adds quite a bit of weight back. So these don't end up being as light as you would think, but they are a little more modern. We have the bolt hold open. This is only available on some of the models. They've improved the trigger. They've also added a larger pistol grip with the storage compartment. Lots of things, like I said, this has its own video. We'll get into all the variations in, in there. These are offered in 76239 now. IWI did, excuse me, IMI did experiment with this caliber, but never put it into production with the older Galils. They also, of course, do 556, which is standard. And 762 NATO, which had always been offered at least since the late 70s in the original Galil, but for export. The IDF always used the 556 version. Now, I w want to mention a few points here before we conclude. IMI was restructured and partially privatized after the end of the Clo War, and in 2000 or thereabouts became IWI. Still same company, really. Also, as I said, the Galil became quite successful in South America, and one of its big users was Colombia. In fact, they obtained a license to produce the Galil in Colombia, and they wouldn't just make it, they would try to improve upon it. Now, IMI worked with the Micro Galil in the 90s and early 2000s, but Colombia also worked on it and there's actually quite a debate as to really who has official authorship or, you know, most should receive most of the credit for the ACE, Colombia or Israel. I'm not going to get into that here, but I wanted to give credit where credit was due because some of the work on the ACE was definitely done in Colombia. The ACE is not used, at least not in any numbers worth talking about, certainly is not standard issue in the IDF. It was never intended to be, though. This was always for an export, and it's been quite successful. A lot of nations have tried it out. Some have even adopted it as their standard issue. Vietnam is a large purchaser. In fact, they're also manufacturing the ACE in Vietnam today under license. It's still being manufactured in Colombia. Chile also uses it, as does Peru. And since this was really only first introduced in 2008, so just about a decade ago, and has undergone some updates and changes since then, we don't really know where it'll end up. I think it does appeal to some nations because we still have a machined receiver, not many guns, and it's actually steel, not alloy. We have the polymer lower, though. We still have plenty of rails, plenty of modern features. We have nice adjustable iron sights. Barrel lengths can range from 8.5 all the way out to 22 or 24, I think, is the longest. I know they go over 500 millimeters and a lot of things in between. Like I said, there's in three caliber, uh, yeah, three different calibers. There's also the three different gas, gas link systems, AR, ARM style, SAR style, and MAR style. So there's really a wide range and they're really starting to be made in several places. Another recent manufacturer is Fort in Ukraine, although this isn't used by the Ukrainian military en masse, although I believe some of their special forces. Now, kind of interestingly again, one of the biggest competitions to the IWI Ace is the IWI Tavor series and IWI X95. And of course, that's what the IDF has gone with, is the newer bullpup. But, you know, different styles for different I guess tastes. 
So the Galil, like I said a little bit ago, didn't really have the trajectory that I think Israel Gali had initially, you know, envisioned for it. It didn't really become as predominant and widespread and see as much use in the IDF as he had hoped. But on the other hand, it's probably had a longer life expectancy, lifespan, than most other guns of its era, thanks to the ACE. And of course, it's very popular in the USA because of collectors. In the early 80s, a company known as Magnum Research imported the AR, a semi-automatic version of the AR, as the Model 361. They also imported a version of the ARM as the three, yeah, 372. And they would even do these in 762 NATO. They would not do an SAR, and of course they wouldn't do an MAR because they didn't exist at the time. After Magnum Research, Action Arms would take over in the mid 80s and keep on importing under slightly different model names, the, nine, the, the 386 was based on the 361, but instead of having the original 18-inch barrel, it would have a 16. They did this so it couldn't mount a bayonet and looked a little less threatening, a little more sportery. They would turn the ARM 372 into the 392, again with a 16-inch barrel. Bipods were kind of in and out. If some, some would have the bipod lugs, some wouldn't, wood handguards, polymer. There's several different minor variations. And there would be a post-ban run from Action Arms. There would also be some from Springfield. And Mossberg, believe it or not, it's a very strange fit, would import some post-ban receivers in the 90s. These would start with like the 386S and end with guns like the 720S. Continuing both 5.56 is kind of the standard and 7.62 NATO is kind of a secondary choice. They would not ever do a pre-banned semi-auto civilian 7.6239. They would also never do an SAR or an MAR. That's why if you want one of those, you pretty much have to go to a kit build. Well, after the imports ended in all forms, there was kind of a fallow period in the American market where some autos weren't really available. But then a large number of parts kits came over and companies like Century Arms, seeing, excuse me, Century Arms, a high rapid fire, and eventually CNC Warrior and Hibley Firearms and others would start building Galils from kits. And finally, semi-auto SARs and MARs became gettable. And then, just about three years ago, a semi-automatic version of the ACE started to come in. It began with a pistol in 76239 and expanded from there to the point we were at today in 2018 where you can get pistols and rifles in all three calibers, although they don't do all the barrel links yet and they don't do a version that takes Galil mags all the 223 guns will take standard NATO mags, and I understand why they did it. Also, of course, all the newer NATO guns would have the 1 in 7 twist rate for the 62 grain. In, over in Israel, IMI would start to do the switch over in the mid to late 80s, like most companies would do. And that's really where we stand today with the history of the Galil. There aren't really any left in IDF service, but they are still around, especially in form of the ACE in South America, in parts of East Asia, and I'm sure in Africa. For a fact, I know that the R4s and R5s are still going strong in South Africa. They've thought about replacing them, but it's just not been worth it. And just a couple of years ago, they issued a contract to Littleton to modernize, i.e. put lots of rails on their guns for more modern use. So it's actually a war horse that's been chugging along. Well, I think that's as much as you can stand me and as much as I can talk in one sitting. So really appreciate you, you bearing with me. I, I, I do these because I want to share and because some of these guns like this one here are going to probably go on the auction block and I wanted to mention it before it found a new home while I still had it to show you. And if you want to know more about the 
Ace series, please check the playlist. You'll see that video there shortly if it's not already there. And if you'd like to know more about the LM5, it has its own video that really goes into the South African history. But I really just wanted to present these guns because they're very interesting. I've always liked the Kalashnikov and I've always had an interest in the IDF and because it really has seen a lot of use. I'm not getting into the politics of it all, but you can't deny that Israel has fought a number of skirmishes in very harsh environments and the Galil proved itself to be a very solid gun if also a little heavy and expensive to make by the standards of today. We really appreciate you tuning in. If you like the video and aren't asleep, if you are, wake up, please click like. And if you'd like to help support us, please click on the link and check out our Patreon page. This is Misha. And we'll catch you next time.